Hi, and welcome to the 91 Day Success Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan, and I am really excited today to have with me John Wright. John's going to be talking about a number of topics today that I know virtually nothing about. And I love that because that means it's going to be a great opportunity for me to learn, but also for you to learn. So, John, as we get started, if you would, for people that don't know you or well, would you give us kind of the elevator pitch introduction, a little bit about who you are and some of the topics that you want to chat about today? Sure. Um, I've got an engineering background. I went straight into professional gambling after that. I've been in iGaming and affiliate marketing for close to 20 years, or actually just over 20 years. And I've come full circle to building affiliate sites and realizing I like building things. And I'm going back to my engineering roots. So I'm now build software tools for affiliate marketers. And I guess I'm good with data. So I kind of try to make life easier for affiliates with data. I love it. I love it. And, and, and very interesting background. I love how, you know, getting into professional gambling and iGaming and all that. Tell us a little bit about how did you make that transition from that field and that that interest over into affiliate marketing? What Tell me a little bit about your past journey and what how that, that happened. Yeah, I mean, I was doing a bunch of things, uh, bonus hunting, a bit of professional poker online and a bit of sports betting. And from that, you just kind of like look at all these sites that you're playing. And you, you got to think, if these companies can afford to constantly pay me, what's on the other side of the fence? There's a big ecosystem yeah. there. And you scroll down to the bottom of the website and you keep seeing this like affiliate program. You click on it and then it's like you can get 30% revenue share of the losses of players that you send over to the sites. So naturally, being a bonus hunter, I'm always looking for the best offers. So I go straight into Google type in best casino bonuses and I find all these affiliate sites and you click on the offers. I'm probably taking money from the ecosystem, but behind it are hundreds of players that uh, put money into that ecosystem. So that was my first exposure. The second exposure was I got an opportunity to join a few affiliate programs, uh, run the entire online casino. So I saw firsthand how much affiliates were making and I got a really good look into how they actually got started. And what I've realized is that they never really had a formal background. Like they didn't go to school for SEO. They didn't go to school for entrepreneurship or uh, business, anything. They sure. had random backgrounds, but they all basically just figured it out. They're like, they built websites. Some of them built them themselves with their own coding. Other people just use WordPress, but it didn't matter. And I realized that they also did most of this stuff without a budget. You didn't need hundreds of thousands of dollars to get started. Most of these people started with nothing. So that was a really good insight. And that caused me to say, let me also compete in this space. So at some point in the last 12 years, I started building affiliate websites, uh, gaining more experience and kind of learning the building blocks of what those affiliates had to do to be successful. And yeah, now it's now that I've been working in this for so long, I just kind of see the pain points and going, I think there's more to be done here. Um, I'm tired of building affiliate sites in the traditional sense of build content, SEO, I've done that, but um, like I said, I, I need engineering stuff to, to keep me entertained. Oh, really, really interesting journey that you've been through. I'm sure you've seen affiliate marketing take a lot of turns and changes over the years that, that you've been involved and see things there. How would you describe for somebody that's not into affiliate marketing at this point, but interested in it, how does that person learn? How do they get started? What, what should that person be doing to learn more and get involved in affiliate marketing and determine if it's a, a good venture for them? Uh, that's a tough question. Um, like I said, going back to like the 10, 15 years ago, when I saw these affiliates get started, there were no courses. There were no guides to affiliate marketing. Uh, you just basically figured it out on your own. And at some point, these people started going to conferences and networking and making kind of joining these communities. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of affiliate communities. So I'd say that's probably one of the best places to start, but it can also be the worst place because you got to imagine the most successful affiliates don't always spend their time on forums unless they're incentivized, like it's their own community. I was um, just going to ask that, yeah. So I'll, I'll give one shout out to, there's numerous affiliate courses out there, but one course that I trust is good and I know some students that have actually had success with it is the Affiliate Lab by Matt Diggity. And mm -hmm. he's basically built his affiliate sites and he's an engineer. So what does he do? He documents the process and says, I'm going to build you a system that helps you get started. So to this day, I do not know if you can get a college or university degree doing affiliate marketing. Mm -hmm. You can learn about marketing. You can learn about mm -hmm. 
building websites, you can learn about business development and all those things, but it's just not the same as like, literally just get your hands dirty. It's like, just go build something, make the mistakes, learn from it and iterate. So much like so many things in the digital marketing world where I, I, you and I probably both met people who have gotten college degrees, for example, in digital marketing, and they come out and they really don't understand what's happening in 2023 because what they learned was from 2015. Uh, and it's just so far behind the loop of what's happening. I assume affiliate marketing is, again, very similar, but again, they're like, you have never heard of a a course or something offered from a college. Uh, it's interesting to hear you mention Matt Diggity. Matt's very big in my world, in the SEO world as well, and very well respected. Uh, and I did know he did some affiliate stuff, but I didn't know the details. So that's that's a great recommendation. As, as you look towards the future, what types of things do you see happening? I loved how you said you're really looking for those pain points and how you can address some of those, but what trends and changes do you see coming in the affiliate marketing world over the next couple of years? Yeah, really challenging question, but I try to look at it from the point of view of what do affiliates need to do to be successful? We know we can do some tools to help them with some success, but we can't, we can't build that whole roadmap for them. And I've been having a lot of uh, conversations, including podcasts with people like Matt Diggity, uh, Cal Roof and numerous other people. And mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand what is coming around the corner and how do people prepare for it? And there's always this, this discussion about SEO is dead or it's going to get destroyed by AI. And I think um, just from talking to a lot of these people, I think we all forget to realize that people buy from people. So in the B2B Absolutely. space, this is extremely important. But in affiliate marketing, everyone's got the whole mindset of like, I need a scale. I need I need 100,000 hits per day of traffic in order to make 45 sales. And no one really thinks on about the one-on-one. -on -one. And when you start kind of mm -hmm. saying, I'm going to pretend or build content from a one-on-one -on -one basis, um, you're really acting as if like we're here in this room having a conversation. And I think when you treat your content marketing the same, that's probably going to be the future. And I, and I say it from a point of view of how do you as the single affiliate getting started compete against the affiliate marketer that's been doing this for 10, 15 years, that has made millions in the bank, they can buy the best designers, the best SEO, the best tech team, the best everything, and you have that to compete with. So it, it seems intimidating, but my answer to that is it's all about personal branding. I think Google's trying to reward people for being real. And as yes. we're now being flooded with so much AI content, I think people are kind of wary. It's like, is this content automated? Are you the authority behind this topic? And I think people are going to gravitate towards that. And my answer to that is, I think a video and audio is going to be an important part of this moving forward, where it's important for us in B2B, but I think a lot of people overlook it in the B2C space, especially in affiliate marketing. I love how you kind of merge together, John, the affiliate marketing and what I would call topical authority, uh, being that go to expert in the niche, because I agree people buy from people. And, you know, just again, even the people that you talked about, I know Matt talks about that. I know Kyle talks about those things as well. And the importance uh, I, I could go down so many rabbit holes with the SEO discussion. I agree with you entirely. I don't think it's going away. I think it's going to change as it always has evolved. Um, but I'm in 100% agreement with you on that authenticity aspect. And one of the things that uh, I recommend to a lot of our clients who we talk to about topical authority, about how do you become that go-to expert in the niche? Because again, people buy from people is the, the absolute power of video because it's still really difficult, not impossible, and it will certainly get easier, but it's still really difficult to mimic you doing a video talking about something that you're teaching, as opposed to it's very easy to have AI type that out and create that content for you. Uh, so I, I love the, the focus on video and audio as you do that. Are you working on any tools in the background or anything to help affiliate marketers with those? Or where do you see yourself fitting in with that with some of your expertise, John? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one because, I mean, in my experience, when I was building affiliate websites, uh, the one thing that I accidentally discovered was that I, I built a really good tech system that automated a lot of things, but I didn't quite nail the SEO part. And things gotcha. that affiliate marketers need to be good at today is you need to do traffic. Usually we kind of associate SEO as being part of it, but now video is becoming a very important part of it. And then you need to be good with the tech side or... Sometimes the tech can be really light, but I believe the tech is going to get heavier, and more complex as you have more laws and regulations coming into play. I mean, if you look at what a good affiliate should be doing, it should be 
having an optimized list, an optimized offer. And it's not just like the best offer. It's about knowing like you have five offers you can place on your website, which one's going to convert the best. And you're going to need data to look at this. And I believe affiliates don't always look at this data. Um, so I just think it's uh, there's a lot of things that you have to do. And, um, and I just think to try to take some of these things away where there's going to be more automation. I don't think we're going to be the only company that will help with some of this automation. I think there's more coming. And just imagine a world where your ads can re-rank themselves based on performance. And that's what we're looking mm -hmm. to achieve. Uh, our, our main product right now is a stats app. We're kind of like the QuickBooks for affiliates to pull all yep. the data. So we're going to be able to optimize and say, here's your best converting campaigns, your worst converting. So it makes sense to say, send more traffic to the best converting, less traffic to the worst converting. But these things change over time. And that requires you taking the time to look through spreadsheets. So if we can automate this, the only thing that's missing is an API feeding your ads, re-ranking themselves. It sounds complex, but it's also simple. Now, the best affiliates in the space, uh, in almost any affiliate marketing industry, they have this built in-house. But okay. why, why would they share this with you? I'm not going to give you these tools and help you compete against me and take this market share, which I'm enjoying. And exactly. we want to try to do that. And we also think, or I believe that there are going to be a couple other companies that, are, that have the same ethos. And there's other companies that are going to say, I'll give you this tech, but I'm going to take a cut of your business, which there's nothing wrong with that. But I mm -hmm. think we're going to see a weird push and pull of, you know, is the is the market going to get leveled or is it going to get equalized or are the big just going to get bigger? But I think it's going to be a bit of both. AI can help uh, help that big company get bigger, but maybe it can also help that small person say, maybe I actually really do have a chance. Well, it's interesting how you say that. I was just going to ask about the role of AI in that. And, and it's my perspective that AI plays a, a is is in many ways an equalizer in that, yes, it will certainly give the big companies opportunity, but those big companies, as we know, tend to be less nimble and they're not acting on it as quickly. And so there's certainly opportunity for smaller players that are nimble and embracing the technology to really vault themselves ahead, uh, maybe not ahead of the large players, but maybe to up into the same circles because they're able to take advantage of some of those technologies sooner. Uh, I love the concept you're sharing about, you know, and I'm just imagining in my my mind, having an, the ads in an AI tool or something that, that looks to see what's conversion, what's my cost per lead, all that type of stuff, and then automatically re-ranking and optimizing other ads based upon what's happening uh, and the, the amount of time and effort that that could save because it's really a very process-driven uh, methodology that could be followed in that case. And like you said, I think there's so many people that don't pay attention in the affiliates world and any other world to what's happening. And if that data could then be utilized and, and leverage the value that could bring. Now, is that, you talked about your stats product, is that the stats drone uh, project that you're working on? Is that that, or what, what is yeah, the uh, SES tool that you've got there? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of both. It's a, right now we've been on the market for two years as our stats app. So it's like the stats aggregator. Uh, okay. We are working on those ad tools and Sometimes I get nervous when I see competition, but at the same sure. time, I also kind of get a feeling of optimism going, there's going to be enough uh, food to go around for everyone. And Absolutely. it's a good validation that th this is the right thing. Like, I'll just give you another example. Um, so I use Ahrefs and I'm always looking for affiliates linking to uh, affiliate offers that have expired or that that company's gone out of business. The okay. Best, the best example is FTX. I think there are still thousands of domains linking to FTX using a tracking link. And FTX has been offline for a good year. It's, yeah. it's decreasing by maybe one or 200 per month, but there's still legitimate affiliate websites that are still linking to this. And I just think for some companies, when you've got tracking links everywhere, it's kind of like, you know, your room's a mess and you, you're not cleaning it up, but it's like, where's my pen? You know, that's you looking for that tracking link, Correct. sending Correct. lots of traffic there and everyone's losing money in this whole situation. I just think there's so many different little details like this that could be solved. And like, imagine this as well. Let's say you have a blog and it's all about personal finance. Imagine being able to drag and drop something like an AdSense where AdSense might be able to look at the background of your content and say, well, you're talking about personal finance and this page is targeting United Kingdom. Maybe it can actually automatically say, we think these ads would be suitable and just have it work automatically. I think this is what we'll see in the next couple of years as 
we'll try to do this, but I think there'll be a couple of other companies that will, they're, they're all rushing to, to make this a reality. Makes, makes a tremendous amount of sense. And, and, and I really like the way your engineering mind thinks through that. And, and that it makes me think of business intelligence as, as you're doing that. How do you think as an engineer, John, how, how does that, your perspective, I guess, what, tell me about what you think is your unique perspective as it comes to that business intelligence and those analytics, because you're talking about things here. I think that a lot of people don't even think about, and I love the way that you're thinking through that. How, how do you come up with these ideas and how do you think you can integrate those into tools that ultimately help other affiliate marketers do better at what they're trying to do? Yeah, I, I think what we need is AI and, and different types of BI tools. They have the power, but it's not easy to just build these tools and make it work for you. We'll try Correct. to do that. And I think this is actually the next wave of tools. It's not just AI where it's there and it's like you control it. So you control the outcome. But imagine having like a guideline that says, okay, we know that you want to increase your revenue, but what are the different paths for that? Like imagine just being able to have a spider crawl your site and saying, we think we can optimize your site based on all these potential insights. It's up to you to check which ones you think are valid. So I think this is kind of going to be one part of the future. Um, I know for me, in terms of wanting to build these tools, I've just had a natural interest in parts of the data where... Like one of my interests is actually in conversion rate optimization. And ironically enough, uh, last week I did a call with Oliver Kenyon from ConversionWise. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, I said, like, what percentage of people do you know that actually work on CRO? And he's like, it's barely 1%. Kyle Roof, wow. how, many people, how many people work on SEO in the way they should in terms of looking at the data? And he's like, 0.1%. So this whole looking at data is everywhere. It's everywhere in your content. Like look at Surfer AI. I mean, that's basically... a a business intelligence content tool. And yeah. I, I just believe that most people are chasing the wrong thing. Affiliate programs, they, they chase the numbers. They're like, we, we need more customers. And what does that look like? More traffic. But they never look at looking at their website and going, what if we could just double the conversion rate? It's such a foreign concept that maybe it actually would be less effort that has compounding benefits. You double your conversion rate, your affiliates are happy, and the ones that actually look at data, they might actually promote your offer more saying, I don't know what you guys did, but maybe I noticed a new landing page. And I think this is going to be part of the foundations of you know, how things get better. It's People don't look at data, but I think if these tools are built to help them understand the data and do some of it for them, it'll help them make better data-driven decisions. And this is kind of like the core essence of business intelligence. And it's what I think is around the corner for these BI tools. Mm, that, that's really insightful. I, you know, I, I love the way that you're thinking through this. It just, it makes so much sense to me. Talk to me a little bit about from the practical perspective, instead of just focus on traffic and, and that, how do you recommend that affiliate marketers make those personal connections? What type of things should they be doing to be seen as that, from your perspective, at least, John, to be seen as that expert in their niche? Because I know a lot of affiliate marketers represent disparate products over different areas. So it's not just like I can become an expert in the health or beauty niche because I may be doing that and I might be doing survival products and I might be doing cooking stuff at the same time. How does an affiliate marketer that's got a lot of different things going on, how do they be seen as that expert for their niche so that people come to them? Any any recommendations or, or thoughts on that? Yeah, I've been thinking about this this type of question a lot in the last few weeks. And I think it could come down to what do most people do as affiliates or content writers? They usually t cut corners. Like, you, let's pretend you're going to do a website all about book reviews and you're going to cover 100 different books. A lot of people will do the 500 word pieces of content, but the person who's really into it or has the mindset to say, I know I need to up my game and this, these 100 pages need to be 2,500, 5,000 words of content. It's about taking a step further. And I think people just keep forgetting that people like to buy from people and we're always drawn to stories and storytelling. But mm. the best content you can read is I might not want to read a, a book review, but if you can write it in such a way that you draw me in, uh, that is amazing writing. And we don't all have those skills, but I think when you just say, you know what, I'm going to stop caring about SEO for a quick second and just go, what is it to be topical authority and just to write it and say, Hey, my name is so-and-so and I'm not the expert, but I'm interested in this. And you just kind of, you know, act real. I think it's this realness that's going to start connecting more. And I think people keep also forgetting that 
if you look at how other people buy, communities are just as important. So you can create a community, but just think about you wanting to pick a restaurant in your city or a city you're traveling to. What do you do? You go into Google, type in that restaurant. You're going to see all these different restaurant review sites, which are powered by user-generated reviews. It's this user-generated content that's a feedback loop for building trust. And I think people yeah. just get lost in this whole thing about, well, how do you build trust? Hey, here's my picture. Here's my name. Here's my interest in the topic. This is why I'm trying to be a topical authority expert on this on this topic. And I think people just, they never really think about that. And just that one more point is when I was talking to Lachey Lewis, who does B2B content, we were talking about her stories about how she how she uh, tries to help people come up with these um, these writing plans for creating this content. And I shared with her that I noticed that I have a lot of, not a lot, but some affiliate friends that they don't even care about SEO and they don't care about building links. They just write content from a, like, I'm just going to be real and share it with you. Mm -hmm. And I find what they end up with is long form content that's real. It's got, it's got, they've been doing this for a long time and it's always worked. And it's always been amazing to watch them make sales, make a lot of money without caring about links. And they almost are against link building. And of course, you go to Matt Diggity's side of the fence and he's like, links everything. But imagine yes. being able to try to build content as if you don't need links for it to make money. Mm, I love the way you're thinking through that. It fits so much into, again, so much of what I'm hearing talked about in the SEO side. And yeah, I know Matt and others are, are promoting those backlinks, but I think if you ask them, they would even tell you that it, the more you can attract those backlinks versus having to go out and recruit, buy, whatever, uh, the more quality those are going to be and the more quality traffic. Um, one of the things that you know we've dealt with in the SEO field forever has been people going, I need more visitors, I need more visitors. And one of the things that I've always talked about as a marketer is you need the right visitors. In other words, if I, I used to tell clients, and I don't know if it's possible anymore, but you used to be able to go out to Fiverr and for $39, I could send anybody 10,000 visitors to their website. The problem is every one of those visitors was some foreign country overseas and not any of them were ever going to buy anything from you. Or I could spend the same money and write a really good blog post or a really good piece of content or shoot a short form video that might only attract 100 people instead of 10,000. But if 12 of those people were actually buyers that wanted to work with you, were interested in your products or the products that you were marketing through affiliates, that had far more value than the 10,000 views or the 10,000 visits. And it seems like people are finally, in many circumstances, starting to get their arms or their head around that concept that it is really the right traffic, not just any traffic. What's your opinion on that? Do you still see that any traffic is a big contender or do you see people like I do getting into that the right traffic matters? Yeah, it, it needs to be the right traffic matters. I think when you start focusing on it, you're going to do things that are beyond uh, what your SEO tools will say, which is your competition, your top 10 for that, that keyword is going to have an average of 3000 word count and it's going to yep. contain these words. So I love Surfer for what it does, but I think people need to take it a step further and go, what is Surfer not telling me to write about? Well, if you're mm. the expert, you're, you're the one who should be leading the way. And when you do lead yes. the way, what might actually end up happening is maybe your competition starts saying, oh, that's a great angle. Uh, let's also add that into our content. You know, it's just part of that that system. I think people need to just uh, not always use copying or use the SEO hat, so to speak, and go, if you just cared about content, what would this look like? And when you start doing it, you, you end up being kind of scared because you're like, I don't have any tools. I just got like a pen and paper and I just got to write down ideas. Yeah, you can do research. You can ask ChatGPT for feedback, but it, it's going to miss out on the fact that it's only asking the web for what experts are. It's not getting you to sit down and say, spend an hour or two and you know, be the expert, put your expert hat on, and also think about what else could you add that is worthy of being in that content. Oh, I, I think I so embrace what you're saying. I, I like that so much about, you know, probably like you, I, I, I pay attention a lot of what's going on in AI. And I know that, you know, on some of these uh, prompt boards or prompt areas, you plump, even plugins you can get that, you know, show you the most popular plugins. One of them is always, you know, take this article and rewrite it to outrank it. And it's like, that's fine. And I get the purpose behind it. But I so, it so resonates with me what you're saying about if you would simply take a half hour or an hour and say, what could I add to this instead of just 
rewriting it and spinning that content? What could I add to it? What unique angle could I bring to it? What, what unique aspect could I discuss about this that nobody else is discussing? Now you're providing real value that'll get the people interested in that to actually pay attention to you. Because it's one thing to rank, but then if we're talking written content or video or anything for that matter, you need to keep people's attention while they're doing that and just regurgitating what's the number one, two, and three articles are that are ranking currently do probably isn't enough in most cases to bring people to your no-name site that they've never heard of. And even if you can rank, it's probably not going to keep their attention very long. And if you can't keep attention, you're never going to be able to sell things long term. Uh, so that makes me think of, of podcasting. And you'd mentioned a little bit in some of the pre-show notes that we talked about, John, that you also are, are into podcasting. Does podcasting fit in as part of this mix or is that in your mind an entirely different content medium in and of itself? I think it's definitely part of this mix. So I've got two points I want to share. First Please. is with Matt Diggity, I start looking at who does written content and video content very well. And I notice Matt does both really well. When he does mm -hmm. that long form content, he follows it up with the video version of it and he's just knocking it out with rankings. Absolutely. Uh, he's got, I don't know, 140,000 followers on YouTube. I mean, that's quite a bit for our subscribers. So I think uh, when you do it that way, I think there's a lot of people that are just missing out on video. The point I, I, I was thinking about earlier, and I've been thinking about this the past week, is I had someone trying to pitch me some B2B services. So I won't mention their name and hopefully they don't listen to this, but I, I didn't feel confident I wanted to buy from them. And then I started sure. thinking, why don't I want to buy from them? And then I started thinking, well, who do I buy from? Who would I buy from? And who do I actually recommend? So in the B2B space, that actually is... It's probably like a good eight to 10 people. And it's people that I've actually been recommending for quite some time. And when I started looking at it, I'm like, what do they all have in common? Well, almost all of them have a podcast. Um, a lot of them aren't shy to make videos. Um, I've had a chance to, you know, like some of them will host their own podcast, but some will just be guests on other people's podcasts. Sure. And a lot of them are also um, thought leaders in the sense that they share a lot of info for free. So when that person that was trying to pitch me, I'm like, I don't, I've never seen you on a podcast. It, maybe they are, but I don't know. But I also yep. will look through their LinkedIn. And if I'm not seeing them share bits of info, then how do I know that they are that authority? It's There might be people out there that are better than people like Tom Hunt, better than Justin Rowe, but I wouldn't know it. But because right. Tom and Justin were, were never afraid of going, hey, I'm just going to give my best content away. And you could actually use all of the strategy over one year and not pay for it. Well, that's fine. But... I've been able to use Tom's uh, advice in terms of podcasting. Uh, while we were growing our company, we didn't have the budget for it. But Tom basically shares this information for free. I've, I'm at the point now where I'm constantly recommending Tom. And I'm actually yeah. using uh, his B2B podcasting software. So uh, I am a customer. So when I look at who have I bought from, it's uh, Tom's a perfect example of it. Uh, we've actually bought from a guy named... Uh, uh, Peter from useractive.io, which they do B2B, uh, no, they do uh, SaaS designs. Because he does webinars and, and podcasting, I trust him. You know That opens the door for me to say, can we get in on a call for 30 minutes? And then that's, that's winning the sale. So that's in the B2B space. And I believe this is going to be just as useful for B2C. And I think this is already happening. You know, Just look at podcasts, shows that are taking off. You go on YouTube and... Full circle, right back to Matt. I mean, Matt's all over the show. He says that for video, he gets a really strong conversions. He's like, the conversion uh, funnel that happens through YouTube is a lot stronger than the written content because you get oh. to see Matt in person. It's like you yeah. also doing your, your podcast videos. It's uh, people can probably just spend five minutes and go, yeah, I trust this guy. Well, it's, it's interesting you say that because my journey to topical authority in my niche, and even though it's not affiliate related, started... Uh, in earnest about a year ago. Uh, I'd been toying around with it, thinking about what I wanted to do, and then finally decided a year ago, I was going to get really serious and I was going to start doing a video a day. I'm going to start doing you know multiple bits of content every week. I'm going to do multiple social media posts and really embraced what you just talked about. And it's, it's so good to hear you say that is giving away the content. Uh, and I have a mentor that uh, shared with me that same concept, just give away your knowledge, give away your content, and yes, some people are going to go run with it. And that's okay because those people were never going to buy from you in the first place anyway. 
the people you want to work with though are going to do that. And now it's going to create the credibility for you. You will be that go-to expert in there. Just like you mentioned with Tom, now you're going to say, okay, yeah, Tom gave me a lot of stuff and I used a lot of it, but now I use, I use his services. I pay him and I refer to him because he is that trusted resource. And I, you have other things to do other than just, you know, implement what he talks about. Now you can use the tools and his implementation to expedite what you're doing to grow your business. So, so good to hear that from a totally different perspective and how that comes on through. Um, but I can tell you too, as you mentioned with Matt, video is so powerful in converting. Normally now when I get somebody new at, through my business, when I'm talking to them on the phone, it's very common to hear, wow, I feel like I know you already because you're showing up in my video feed all the time and I trust you. Uh, those never happened on first calls before because nobody knew who anybody was. And that I think in conjunction with what you're saying, what Matt's saying is that power of video. And I, I think podcasting is great for that because it's a great way not only to create long form content like we're doing here, with lots of value, but it's also a great way to do short form content and get those snippets that you're sharing that have so much value and get those out there. So I love that. What do you recommend, John, the people that are, again, thinking about maybe doing podcasting in, again, let's say they're in that affiliate world and they've got different things they're doing. Who, what type of podcast? Should it be an interview like this? Should they be doing monologue? Should they be doing something different? What type of podcast do you recommend mm -hmm for those affiliate marketers to be considering? I got two different answers. And the first one I'm going to say is try things and experiment. Uh, Tom Hunt does this and he's like, he, start, he starts doing a lot of interviews, but then he starts doing monologues. And he says, I'm going to keep doing the monologues because they're getting strong reaction. Listen there to Tom go. and you get to reverse engineer it. Uh, one of Tom's playbooks that I totally copied was uh, be a guest on people's podcasts create like the the training wheels version of your first podcast as mm -hmm. a means of the, of the stepping stone towards creating the podcast that you want to do. So instead of going from the, the top right to the end destination, give yourself some training wheels and build up to it. And maybe to add one more micro step at the very beginning is something I've done and probably you've done this as well. Is just start making YouTube videos. Um, yeah. I, I strongly believe that most people won't get into video because it's intimidating. You yes. record your first video and it's terrible and your first yep. five minute video will probably take you half a day. <laughs> I know some people that they they spend hours and they, they got nothing done and I was almost that person. But I try to use different logic to, to trick myself into doing this. And I think it's a good logic that people should consider, which is we take pictures of ourselves at conferences or you know, you're know you out with friends and family and you have yep. that doc documented on Facebook and Instagram, but not always people will have their work life documented. And if you're doing something that you like doing, why not have a documented version of it, whether it's videos and things like that. So my my one of my first YouTube videos, I watch it and I cringe, but I'm not deleting it. I'm keeping yep. it there. It's I, I try to tell people to think about Pat Flynn when he got started. I don't oh, know, what's the great example? Yeah. Listen to his very first podcast. And he's like, really timid. Uh, you know, probably not the best example to compare. But Joe Rogan's first podcast is like just total rambling. It's like, I don't know what I'm doing, but let's give this a go. And then, you know, 15 years later, number one podcast in the world. It's you just want to get started, but don't think about it going, I need to be number one. And yeah, I like I said, I'm giving away probably more of Tom Hunt's advice here. He also recommends to go uh, to be like really niche or niche and yep. try not try not to aim for the number one topic. So what Correct. I did for my my podcast was it's business intelligence and affiliate marketing. And I specifically didn't want to compete against affiliate marketing as a concept. So I had I had a rhyme and reason be behind what topic I wanted to focus on. So it's kind of weird. I actually went kind of very narrow and very specific, but it actually opened the door for conversion rate optimization, SEO. So it's kind of like I'm, I'm a hub for that concept, but I didn't really say let's be let's try to be number one affiliate marketing. But oddly enough, I'm starting to show up in rankings and maybe it's less competitive. Maybe it's early days. Who knows? Well, I, you know, I think, John, that's probably you've given a lot of great advice. But I think that's probably one of the best bits of advice you've given. And it reminds me of thinking of, you know, like you said, people don't want to start because they're afraid they're not going to be good. And you need to suck before you get good at it. It's just is the way it is. 
Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Sean Cannell from Think Media, and, and he runs a large video marketing conference. And he's saying, like you, he's kept his original videos up, and he actually plays them at his conferences in front of thousands of people to show people, look how terrible this was. I mean, and it was it was abysmal. But now he runs one of the largest video media companies, certainly in the United States. Uh, he's got a huge staff. He does very well. He runs this massive conference. You know, he had people like Gary V and 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 Patrick Pet David and others literally at his conference. We know there's those are not cheap checks to write to get those people. So he's doing very very well. But he didn't get there overnight either. Maybe people discover him today. And like you said, we need to start somewhere before we can get good. We as toddlers, we didn't learn to walk by just jumping up from our, our cradle and, and running around the room. We we pulled ourselves up, we then fell a bunch of times, and then we walked and fell some more and we stumbled. And then sooner or later, we got to the point that mom would chase us around the house. But it didn't happen without trial and error. And whether no matter who you are, that video is the exact same way. I, uh, I think that's just a great, great analogy. Well, question for you on that. I recommend a lot of people when they get started, do live video. Not because live necessarily has more interaction any more than, than any other, but because live forces you to be okay with what you're doing right now and just go with it. What are your thoughts on that, John? It's not something we've ever discussed. I don't think it's a bad idea. I know in doing podcasts, I know we have the power to, to say, okay, there's a little gap there. Like I recorded one uh, yesterday and I had a train of thought that just got lost and I needed a minute to collect myself. If that was live, I'd be like, whatever. Uh, I mean, if we're in a conversation, like basically what we're having right now, I know if I gap, I know you could actually jump and fill right in. So sure, I, I'm not really bothered by it. I just kind of got the thick skin from doing it for so long. But I think it's probably a good way of doing it. And that's actually what I teach people to do if they're going to get into video. I say, don't worry about the mistakes. Mistakes yeah. are those little weird things of authenticity that people, they just don't care about. Like, okay, maybe if you're um you know using too many words like like and whatever which i do i use descript and it it tells me all the things in the oh yes i'm like okay whatever <laughs> me too. i'm not going to you know fix it overnight but i'm also not going to say well done is better than perfect just get those videos yes. done and yeah it's uh throw yourself in the deep end whether it's recording it or whether it's doing a live which becomes recording saved anyways doesn't really matter well, I like what you're talking about there as well. And, and speaking of going live and, and missing, I just lost my thought. But you're right. I'm not I'm not going to edit that out because you know what? That's part of it. I remember now. It's it's about that authenticity. Part of the benefit and the same reason I'm not going to go back and just fix that flub of mine is that authenticity is part of what resonates with your audiences because we're used to, we've grown up where everything's perfect on TV that we're seeing and those ads are perfect. And now we don't trust any of them because we know it's just a paid spokesperson. It doesn't mean anything. When you get on, whether I know you or not, and you give me a testimonial or you talk about what's happening, that has credibility because it's authentic and it's real. And, and I think that is, is so incredibly valuable. Wow. Just so many, so many knowledge bombs here, John. Thank you so much. One of the questions you know that we talk about on our podcast, based on our name, the 91 Day Success Podcast, is if you had to start over or if you were advising someone that was starting over and they had $1,000 and 91 days or three months to, to build a business up to $10,000 in revenue, what might you recommend? I'm, I'm guessing in your case, I've got some ideas of where you're going to go, but I don't want to put that out there yet. Tell me from your perspective, if you were either doing it yourself or advising someone walking through that process, what would you recommend they do in the first 91 days to achieve that success? Yeah, I usually start from the point of view of when you build affiliate websites and you build revenue, you're building assets that can be sold later on. Uh, so, I mean, if you can get an affiliate site making 10K per month, then you could probably flip it for 100, 200K, sometimes more, depend on what you do to it. Uh, in order to get to that point of making an affiliate site successful, I think that the easiest thing that people can do as one of many things is write content. So you can build content and create them on your own websites, but while you don't have any revenue, I think it's actually an interesting way of looking at it going, you have Fiverr and you have sites like Upwork or Freelancer that are freelancing sites and you can get started. You can do this without any profile, without any experience. Uh, obviously, if you're terrible at writing, you need to either fix it or find something you're good at that you can yeah. sell as a service. So I recommend people should start with freelancing because you're going to gain a lot of insights from it where like, here's the perfect one. 
if you do content writing and you do something specific, let's say it's for SaaS companies, what's going to happen is these people that will start ordering your content, they're going to give you insights as to the, these are the templates that I want and it's for SEO mm -hmm. reasons or for whatever, or they're actually going to give you insights that the type of content they need created leads to sales. So you're actually going to start becoming a bit of an expert. You're gaining best practices from people and it's your job to understand who's right and who's wrong or just kind of uh, watch. I mean, if you've got one client that starts growing, well, they're doing something right and you're going to learn from it. So with those skills, you can sell them, but you can also use them for yourself and say, okay, I'm going to dedicate one to two hours per day building my affiliate site up and building that content platform. I think it's an easy way of getting started. And you can also hire writers and say, okay, I'm going to do arbitrage here. I'm going to find writers that are good. And basically, maybe you can get them at two to four cents per word. And maybe you can charge four to eight cents per word. Um, once you start doing these things, they become kind of scalable. So you'll just learn a lot from doing it. And those are basic foundations. And it's just so easy to do. And most people, they, they think the wrong sense. They're like, I, I want the number one affiliate site. I, I want to make 10 grand in my first month. And they don't think about making like a hundred dollars in a day and using that as your foundation. Hmm, what, what great advice there. I love that. That that's so good. And again, just I'm thinking of the, especially as a new affiliate marketer or anybody like that, the ability to start learning and, and becoming growing that expertise while you're making some money. I mean, instead of going, we talked earlier about going to college or university and instead of going to university and spending tens of thousands of dollars to learn something that may or may not have any value to you once you get in the real world, now you're getting paid. Even if it's not a lot, you're actually getting paid to learn something. And what you're learning is real time relevant right now today and going to help you vault whatever you're doing forward as far as your affiliate business, your career, you name it. I, I think that's just tremendous advice. Really, really good. Well, John, question for you. If, if people have been listening and I'm sure they have and saying, wow, how do I get in touch with John and how do I find out more about your products, your offerings? What's the best way for them to get in touch? We'll add the links here, but if somebody's driving down the road right now, listening to the auto version, what do they do to get in touch with you, John, and find out more? Yeah, unfortunately, I've got a pretty common name. So if you search for John Wright on LinkedIn or Facebook, you're going to find thousands of us. So um, I'm John at statsdrone.com. Uh, I've got an affiliate podcast that's called Affiliate BI. Um, that's for business intelligence. So right now, I think we're probably ranking. We're the only ones ranking for that. But if you, I'll pass you my my LinkedIn, and that'll be the that's the easiest way. I'm I'm a big fan of LinkedIn, and that's where I like to spend a lot of my time. Great. Well, we'll put that link up here as well and make sure that people have access to that. And I want to encourage you, John really has brought a tremendous amount of value here. And obviously you can tell he is the expert. He knows what he's talking about. If you're interested in these things, reach out and connect with John. That's actually how we met. I reached out on LinkedIn and said, hey, John, I'm intrigued. And that's how we ended up here on the podcast together. So I can attest to his responsiveness and his professionalism. Uh, he's, he's a gem out there. Don't hesitate to reach out. So, well, hey, everybody, we want to thank you for listening to the podcast today. We always appreciate your listening, spending attention. We'd love it if you'd like the podcast, share it with your friends, and please make sure to tune back in soon. John, thank you for your time today. We are so grateful for you taking time out and joining us. Any parting words you'd like to leave with everybody? Well, now that we've had a really good chance to chat on this podcast, you're now part of my collection of people that I could uh, recommend, and it's building that trust. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the same for you. Make it a great day, everybody. Talk to you on the other side.